Coming up tonight on Game All Night, it's Chris Kirkman from Dice Hate Me Games. Welcome to Game All Night! Well, hello and welcome to Game All Night again. I'm going to be joined by Chris Kirkman in a minute, but I would like to introduce you to a new member of the Game All Night Studios. This is our lovely bartender, Dan. I like to drink. Dan likes to serve drinks. It's it's like a match made in heaven, Dan. That's what I'm here for. Absolutely. If I can so, keep the drinks flowing, then uh, I'm a happy man. Right? I mean, like you, you've noticed, like there have been times my glass has gone empty and this is just, you know... It's not acceptable. It's, it's, it's not. No, acceptable. It's no way to uh, to enjoy a show. No, no, absolutely not. If I'm not enjoying myself, you're not going to be enjoying yourself. That's the way I like to look at it. So, speaking of said beverage, what is in your glass oh, this evening, let's see. sir? I am working on Victory Brewing Sour Monkey. Ah. And I love me a good sour. Golden Monkey was my favorite beer for years uh, when I first started getting into craft. That's a triple, right? That's right. Absolutely. Very tasty, very tasty. Um, I decided not to go for a beer today. Um, we are doing a bullet mule. So it's a bourbon mule, but made it with a little bit of bullet tonight. So that'll be clinking around in my glass. A little ginger, a little lime. So our guest today, Mr. Kirkman, you have a beverage, sir. What is that this evening? I do indeed. Uh, it is a, hold on, let me give you props to this. This is a Breakside Salted Caramel Stout from Portland, Oregon. Wow, so, I don't think we could get three more different drinks than we have right now. <laughs> Absolutely. You do and, like your And stouts. I'm usually, I do love my stouts. I do love my bourbon as well. So props to your drink. Well, you know, I kind of had a 50-50 shot when I started tonight. And I kind of, <laughs> I went with a bourbon. And that's okay. Bullet's a great standby. I love it. I love it. Oh, that's great. Yep. So Chris Kirkman is now I'm I'm not sure exactly what your title is these days, but you are Dice <laughs> Hate Me Games. I am. Uh we uh I co own Greater Than Games with uh Adam, Paul, and Christopher, the original okay. founders of Greater Than Games. And so we merged in 2015, and so now we are Greater Than Games is the umbrella company and uh Dice Hate Me Games is a, a studio model underneath it now. So my official title is Game Development Director for Greater Than Games. Nice. What I love about Dice Hate Me is, A, it's kind of brewed in, in our backyard. Like, you're from down Maryland way, am I correct? Uh, North Carolina. North Carolina. That's right. That's right. I apologize. I did get the south of the Mason-Dixon line correct, though. That's the important <laughs> yeah, part. Yeah, you got it. And I, had, <laughs> you know and I used is? to live in D.C. at some point, so it's close enough, but yeah. It, it's the unpub that gets me, because that mm -hmm. is in Baltimore, which is in Maryland. So, Right. All right. So, Dice Hate Me Games, you have a very specific niche with Dice Hate Me, and I imagine you've turned away many games that don't fit said niche that might still be great games, I love where it fits. How do you describe that for people? Uh, it's what I call retro Americana aesthetic. And okay. simply what that means, uh, mechanically, it means that we're, we have a lot of games that have Euro mechanics, but they've been sort of Americanized with a theme. So it's a hybrid. And uh, so we tackle um, each of the, the games are set during a different time period in American history. Mm -hmm. uh, and that that is brought out by the aesthetics. So, so like, for instance, Viva Java is the uh, Viva Java. The coffee game is set in 1950s coffee culture. Right. Um, Carnival. The first release we did was 1920s, 1930s uh, sideshow carnival traveling carnival style. Um, compounded is 1960s, 1970s, a science textbook era. So everything has a certain visual aesthetic that sets it in a certain time period in American history. And also sometimes we'll actually have history games like New Bedford, which is set during the 1860s in New Bedford, Massachusetts. So that's how I would describe it to anybody who was asking about what is the Dice Hate Me aesthetic? It, it's retro right. Americana. Now, I, I have to imagine that that has to bring a lot of limitations in on the kind of games you can offer or, you know, you have to see games that you love and go, it's a great game. I just don't know <laughs> without a complete re-theme if it's a fit or not, right? 
For the Dice Hate Me product line, yes. Uh, and generally speaking, when I find a game that fits the Dice Hate Me line, it has been built with that theme in mind, so we don't have to really retheme. We've never really, we've tweaked themes a little, but we've never had to retheme anything because those games have always been built with that theme in mind, which has been right. great. Um, now that, you know, I'm with Greater Than Games, and we're all merged together, we have, I have, when I'm scouting and trying to find other games and develop games, I have more of a leeway because if they don't fit into the Dice Hate Me aesthetic in the studio, we can just put it under Greater Than Games or uh, Fabled Nexus was our old uh, brand or imprint that we started, which we're actually going to start phasing out a little bit simply because we want to have more brand awareness for Greater Than Games. But sure. we can do those types of games like Spirit Island and Fate of the Elder Gods, which would never fit into the Dice Hate Me aesthetic, but are still great games and we can have fun putting them out. Yeah, I mean, it, it definitely, from a business standpoint, you have to, you know, you build a brand on a thing, but then you have to be able to diversify it a little bit to be able to right. have more appeal, right? Makes yeah, sense. absolutely. And yeah, and the benefit of like trying to, to keep the Dice Hate Me line in the same, it, it's kind of set in the same shared universe. So mm -hmm. when I set out to do it, um, you know, I thought about, you know, like John Hughes and Kevin Smith and a lot of people who have created these uh, worlds where all their characters live in. And that's what the Dice Hate Me games really are. They all have references to each other inside as Easter eggs and things like that. But we do have to have diversification, especially in this marketplace. So the 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 freedom to put out something like a Spirit Island or a Fate of the Elder Gods is free for me. So it's been great since the merge. So let's go back to Spirit Island seems to be like a, a pretty crazy new game and it kind of I don't want to say it kind of came out of nowhere because obviously y'all were talking about it and everything but that one was one of the, I, I would have to argue that that was one of the first ones to kind of tax the system and you know tax the production lines a little bit so what was that experience like because that I think that was kind of new for you at the time because I saw you guys at PAX and it was like we have a few left and then there was out <laughs> yeah spirit island has been really interesting for us because uh that was a game that greater the games had actually signed and we wanted to develop before we merged and okay. i'd played it a few times and i agreed that it was a good game uh we we kick-started shortly after the merger and it, it did pretty well um kind of think if i recall correctly in the ninety thousand dollar range which was fine for us to do like a four thousand print run for the first edition right so um but yeah, it got behind on production simply because there were so much art assets that go into it. Uh, we had challenges for the miniatures. There was a lot of things that the that myself and the Greater Than Games team hadn't really tackled on that scale before, at least with that type of a game and the scope of the art projects for it, especially having external artists that we had to hire. Uh, I had managed external art for Dice Hate Me Games products before, like Brewcrafters and things like that. They had a lot sure. of art assets, but it was only like one or two artists. Spirit Island had, you know, eight or 10. So it was a big product. So it came out late, but when it came out, it was interesting because you just, you believe in a product and you believe in a game because you, you know it's good, but you just mm -hmm. never know until it's in the marketplace if it's going to take off. Luckily, most of the things that we've produced have done well, but Spirit Island so far has been just, just like hotcakes. It's been crazy. So we pulled the trigger. We immediately saw the 4,000 4, print run, which, uh, third of that went to Kickstarter backers. That was gone immediately. Then we pulled the trigger on a, I think if I recall correctly, a 16,000 print run. Oh, wow. That, that one was completely gone in about 30 days. And now we're waiting for the third print run to come in, which I think, I hope Paul doesn't kill me for these numbers, but I think it's about <laughs> 16,000 as well. And um, almost all of them have been uh, sold through pre-orders for detail distribution and retails. So wow. it's, it's just been allocated. phenomenal. When you find a hit like that, I mean, you know, how do you, how do you justify like this one taking off and then your other babies kind of holding back? What's, you know, it's, I think I can put my finger on the synergies that's created with spirit Island. You have, um, variable player powers, which of course people love, right. Uh, with a co-op in general, uh, for something like spirit Island, um, there's, you can have it. Sometimes co-ops have alpha, player problems like somebody's mm -hmm. going to take over and say you got to do this 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 and this but it's very difficult for anybody to do that in spirit island because there's so many moving parts between all the powers and how they work together around the table so you you are 100 percent managing that spirit in front of you and offering suggestions to the group as you play and so nobody can kind of sit down and say okay well you need to do this you need to do this you need to do this so everyone feels like right. they have a stake 
in what's happening. It's not like you There's have the medic, a... you have the researcher, and we're just going to, you do this, you fly around, and I'll stay here and build research stations the whole time. You can't... Exactly. Gotcha. And I think part of the, uh, one thing that was worried a little bit when we put it out was the complexity, but I think that's been its strong suit is that it is one of the most sort of immersive and complex uh, co-ops that have come out. So it makes you feel invested in the gameplay as well because there's a lot going on, but it's not completely overwhelming. Um, and you're fighting against these incredible odds. The theme is different because, you know, people haven't seen this you know kind of anti-colonial theme. Um, you're trying to play as the spirits and the natives to, to fend off the people who are trying to overpopulate the island and come in from the outside. So all these things have worked together sort of to synergize uh, in the market. And of course, obviously great buzz from the first adopters, the Kickstarter backers who got it and started playing it and have just lit up the forums. Like right. people talk about, it's got a lot of things to talk about. Like, you know, Sentinels of the Multiverse does that too. Some Dice Hate Me games do that as well that have okay. uh, variability and player powers. But people are on the forums going, last night I played, you know, these three spirits. How, could we synergize something else? Have you, where are you running with this? And so people just love to talk about it, which has been great. Yeah, I mean, that's what you want. We want the water cooler talk after a game, right? We want to be oh, yeah. still thinking about it when we drive home because otherwise it's just an exercise to pass a little time. So when you get that little extra oomph. So do you have any plans for anything in the future in the Spirit Island universe or are you working on other stuff? <laughs> yeah, Eric, <laughs> the designer... He is uh he had ideas for expansions while we were in production and, and <laughs> we finally just had to say, look, let's get this game out first. Let's get the game base game out and branch and claw, which is the first expansion for it, because we were already behind on production. He just has tons of ideas. So yeah, there's a lot of ideas and stuff in development and, and uh and playtest modes right now. So that you will see some more Spirit Island content coming for sure. Great. Do you think now how much of this do you think is owed to the fact that it's almost like a, a reverse on the co-op because it's not it's more like everybody's playing one versus like the many kind of in that it's like it's it's a different take on the formula than we're all trying to defend against this thing how do you think do you think that has anything to do with it i think it does because it offers a different way to play a co-op than what you're uh, uh, you know, used to you're you know, we think back on what the, one of the classic co-ops that we started with, everybody played pandemic and it was right. just a huge hit. And, um, but you're basically you're starting out in a spot and these things kind of spread out now in spirit Island, things are coming from outside and spreading in. Mm -hmm. So you're trying to push that back and to move things around. And it's just a different, a different experience mechanically than all of that. And then, right. and also it, in, it includes story, but not in such a way as something like Arkham Horror or Eldritch Horror, whereas Eldritch Horror and Arkham Horror are very much story driven. Uh, the story in Spirit Island is emergent. So, you know, each game is different and creates its own story on its own. You're like, oh, wow. You, I remember when you pushed those toward the edge and I was Ocean's Hunger Grasp and I was able to like raise up and like wipe out like 10 guys, you know, and <laughs> drag them into the sea, you know. Right. Because so, we yeah. all want those big storybook moments, right? And I think that, exactly. you know, when the game can tell a story and you can make one that fits, it makes sense. So absolutely. So, so let's flip. So that would that would arguably want to be one of the better successes. And then I look on the board behind you and a personal other side. Personal Sorry, disappointment. Here. Not yeah, your right diploma. <laughs> right. The um Yeah, not my diploma. I didn't fill it that one. Right, right. This one. No, I'd say the but, um the monster but, truck rally, you know, yeah. it was um, you know, I backed it. I really wanted to see this, you know, Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. I thought it was <laughs> it was really good and it was gonna it was, you know, dragon sized box. I mean, it had a, it had it all, right? So yeah. It had minis, it had what what happened? I mean, that's one of the babies <laughs> that didn't make it. It is, and it's and the reason why it sits right over there is to remind me daily that you got to stay humble, you got to work hard and you just got to keep pushing because, you know, I mean, one of these days I'd like to see monster truck mayhem happen. And, uh, in my personal opinion, I think that it would do really well in retail and especially at conventions because right. every time we've had it on the table, people have just heard the roars and the, and the, the franticness of the real time racing and things that happen and they love it. And if we'd had copies while all that was being demoed, we could have sold a ton of them. Right. Um, the problem, I think, with with this particular project was 
the first time around, uh, real time uh, dice rolling games are, are tough sale on Kickstarter. None of them have really done very well. Uh, they're hard to translate that energy that you that you get through video, even though you can still kind of get that energy. But it's like going to a live concert. Sure. Um, the concert recording is going to try to capture some of that excitement, but it'll never be as good as being there in person. And then that's, I think, part of Monster Truck Mayhem. Um, unfortunately, it also, we, we tried the first time to launch it uh, and do it without stretch goals. Right. We thought that Kickstarter was uh, in a... Um, in an environment now that people realize that, okay, there's a product and uh, we're wanting to give you that product and we're wanting to give you the product, the absolute best we can and how we would want to produce it. And we left it up to the consumer to say, okay, and we're going to give it to you at a discount, but we're not going to just go into this kind of circus atmosphere and like keep adding on all these stretch goals and things. You, you, we found out pretty quickly that Kickstarter wasn't ready for that yet. And uh, they, we had a great fan base, right? And people were excited about Monster Truck Mayhem, but without that sort of uh, carrot and stick um, setup that's been prevalent on Kickstarter since the beginning, mm-hmm. pretty much, or at least since 2011, uh, it just it just fell flat. There were a couple other projects around the same time that were trying the same thing, and they all fell pretty flat, too. So, unfortunately, the second time, we said, okay, well, we'll go back to the drawing board, and we will break things out into a stretch goal format, and we'll say, okay, you can buy in at this certain amount, which is less expensive than the other one was, but then you could, you know, buy up and then we'll put stretch goals into it. The unfortunate part of that was after the merger, we're not able to put the overall funding goal at the, at the comfortable level where I felt like we could reach and push forward for stretch goals. And that's just, it's all business it's decisions you have to make. Sure. And because of that, it did not fund at a, it didn't, it didn't, it didn't get to cross that threshold where, all of a sudden, people could say, oh, we're going to make it and we're going to get stretch goals. Now people got nervous and they said, well, maybe it's not going to make it. Maybe we're not going to get stretch goals and we're not going to get the game that was promised the first time around. So it was just a perfect storm of really bad circumstances on the first Kickstarter campaign and the second Kickstarter campaign. And a lot of that, I just honestly feel like it had to do with translating the real-time dice rolling to a Kickstarter format. That is I- at its core is what happened. I think real time is it's a tough sell. It really is. It is. I think you know it. Like you say, it's one of those things. You know, I look at um, Captain Sonar is a great example, and I think the only reason that got the traction it got was just because of word of mouth, right? You got eight mm-hmm. people, and you can play this game. But guess what? If you play it with anything less than eight, it kind of it's not nearly as good. You know, right. and how often do you have like eight people standing around? Maybe nine, because yeah. you could have somebody being a captain if you wanted or whatever. But but still, it's it's a very tough sell. And I think that, you know, your hardcore, mini-moving kind of person struggles with, you know, the variability and fun, frankly, that comes from right. that completely frenetic experience that you guys were showing with that one. So Yeah, and I think that if we had a chance to really do it again and we put some money into sending out several copies of this game and passing it around to different people to get you know more upfront talk about it um probably more lead time of showing it at cons i mean we could try to market the heck out of this if we can but at this right. point we have so many other projects that we have to to dedicate our time to so this one is one that we may return to later and we may decide to just do a test um uh, a, a small test in the market without kickstarter uh pull it out of some cons see how the sales go for for it there and then and then roll from that but it, it would be at least 2019 before we you know even try to do that but the game is pretty much done we just need to make it i totally want the 3d map where the trucks will roll down the hill (laughs) and you know that would be amazing put a little mud bog in there i come on like we need to make we'll get some stomper trucks get some stomper trucks and just yeah you know and why this one triggers and i think maybe it's just my age group but you know we kind of lived in the time when you know, Bigfoot showed up, right? I mean, it was in, you know, oh, Roadhouse, yeah. for crying out loud. Roadhouse had Bigfoot. Yeah. I had a friend who drove a monster truck and almost crashed it. It was hysterical. But, you know, that that was just the thing, right? Like, it was, mm-hmm. it was part of that, you know, growing up in the 80s and things. And it, this game almost feels like it was built back then. And it's just been sitting in somebody's garage. And 
It's supposed to. That was the aesthetic for the game too. It was set during the eighties, during the height of monster truck, uh, you know, fanat- fanaticism, and and a lot of people, like I said, our age and you know, slightly younger, they 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 the theme resonates with them, and they want to share it with their kids. You know, we had so many people come by the and they at at like Origins when we're demoing it, right, and would just be gravitate toward it, and their kids would want to play, and their kids would have a ball. And that's why I think that I, it, it would really do well in the secondary marketplace with people because it resonates. Obviously, it didn't hold you back. You guys still come out. You still develop a game. You were hot on the heels of Brew Crafters at that point, which it's not Misery Farm or, you know, and it's not even Misery Beer. I did say that earlier, but it's not, <laughs> it, it's fun. Yeah. I like running my production line and, you know, I kind of get kind of get attached to the beers like oh, I'm going to. No, I'm not going to brew a Lambic. Come on. That's, I don't want any fruity beer. I want to brew the stouts. I want to, I want to brew it these is, guys. It is hilarious. Like even me, when I'll play it, um, so every now and then I'll go the Budweiser route and crank out a bunch of cheap <laughs> ales or whatever like that. And maybe infuse hops once or twice here and there. But like I'm dedicated to my stouters, I, I feel dirty when I'm, <laughs> I'm putting ales out. Whereas oh. Dan Patrice loves his hoppy beers, and so he's cranking out ales and hops and fusing the crap out of everything, and it's, it's hilarious. Yeah. No, I, I I love it. I love it. I mean, it's that's how you can tell I love a game, because I got all my extra bits. I got my storage in these little bead click boxes. Oh, that yeah. I, all, oh, it's, it's like, if for those of you... that's the standard, Chris, then you love a lot of games, because uh, there's a... <laughs> There are a few pimped out up there, yes. Yes. Pimp out a lot of stuff up there, yeah. No, no doubt. So, but it's no, it's very true. Like I, when when I love a thing, I want to kind of, I want to take it to the next level or give it the tactile thing that it's missing. You know, it's yeah, that's important. I think it's great. We're gonna take a quick break, and we'll be right back after this. Hey everyone, I hope you're enjoying the show. Real quick, I just wanted to take a moment to let you know a few things about us. Number one is we have a Pod Pledge page. Now on there, you can donate any amount, uh, monthly, weekly, daily, whatever, and any of that goes directly to support the show, build the sets, better equipment, and all those things. I'm not trying to get rich. I'm not trying to quit my day job. It just anything helps. Number two is please check out our social media. If you're not following us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, please do so. We definitely interact with our people a lot on there uh, because we want you guys to be part of this show. Also, be sure to subscribe to YouTube. You know that little red button down there? Make sure you're clicking that and also do the bell icon so that you can get notified whenever we post a video. Once, twice, maybe three times a week. Lastly, please be sure to tell your friends. Whether you retweet something, whether you go out and you tell them about the channel, show them a show, anything you can do to get the word out, we would greatly appreciate it. So that's it. I'm now going to return you to your regularly scheduled program. Operators are standing by. So I'm back with Chris Kirkman from (laughs) Dice Hate Me Games. And uh, we've been talking on the break a little bit about uh, the DC multiverse universe and all the crossovers. And with with one exception, the movies that just kind of aren't living up to what they should be. You know, it's just kind of, I don't know. He talks about it a lot. So, so in case you don't know, Chris is on two podcasts. And obviously you run the State of Games, which is kind of mm-hmm. the... Uh, if you want to know a lot about what's going on with Dice Hate Me and Greater Than, behind the scenes, you know, you have your crew there. TC graces you occasionally with his <laughs> musk. But the other show that you're on is you're on the Geek All-Stars, which is another podcast. I mean, both. let's be honest, both your podcasts, if they're two hours, they're short um <laughs> yeah we do run a little long geek all stars the last one we just recorded last night was three hours and 45 minutes yikes now was this the yeah. the summer movie special or was that no that, that was one happened uh, a couple of weeks we, ago right uh yeah we dropped about two or three weeks ago and we actually record that one with marty and tony from rolling dice taking names right. every year so yeah we we do that one that one runs a little bit long although we kept it to about an hour and 45 minutes this year it was it's not, not bad. too bad <laughs> all the southern gentlemen in the same room it's just yeah it's going to be moon pies and moonshine is what's going to happen yes exactly right yep 
Yeah. But you guys had a lot of fun. So, so, so any secrets? Who's ahead? Like, I mean, who who had the oh, Avengers? Well, that's me. So, okay. yeah. So I'm ahead. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we're only still we're still in May. So okay. um, there are some some blockbusters that are kind of coming out, about to hit. We're gonna have uh, Deadpool coming out. We've got at the end of the month. Um, why am I blanking on? Oh, Jurassic World. So we've got several. Uh, are these larger projects that are come out, but I'm telling you, uh, Avengers is just a, just a juggernaut and I'm really loving every minute of it. And what amazes me is how many people are going to see it and not having seen maybe even half of the other movies. Cause I mean, I get asked that a lot. Like you saw it, did, did you need to see like, and it's but... amazing too. It's got the lead in from black Panther too. So right. they planned it just right. And you know they're continuing from Black Panther, and it's such a huge movie. And now people have seen that; they want to see the Avengers. So it's all they're Marvel's doing no wrong right now. No, absolutely. And then you turn around, and while Marvel's doing that, DC is still where your heart is. Am I correct? You're you're a DC. No, guy. I'm a, I'm a Marvel guy. I'm a Marvel oh, are guy. You? Okay. Yeah, Dan's the DC guy, and, okay. but I do love DC. I do love the Flash. So, and Flash is probably if I pick my one favorite the, uh, comic character, the Flash is the one. But I grew up with Marvel, um, very very steeped in Marvel lore. Uh, but yeah, Dan and I are good for each other because we kind of are foils for each other because he's really the DC and knows DC lore, and I know Marvel lore, and so we kind of trade back and forth. And I teased you. I know where you're going with this. But I teased Dan about the DC universe because <laughs> we both want it to be good, and it's just not. It's yeah, it's almost like it's they're trying to to jump start it, but then they've never. But that's just the thing, right? DC's just never had cohesion all the way through. It's you know, right. it's like oh well, we had we have had how many four Superman support super persons by now? Super persons, <laughs> yeah, yeah, super persons, yeah. We've had we've had four different ones. How many Batman? I mean, it's been a lot. So it's. You know, yeah. how can you have cohesion without the cohesive actors? Don't Let's not even get started with directors. You know, the MCU had yeah. such a clear vision. I mean, John Favreau doesn't have to direct every single movie after Iron Man to make it work, obviously. Right. 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 You know, the best when movies plays that have in, come have been without him. And it plays into uh, the, the, the way the comic book uh universes existed so you know dc is always they had to have the crisis on infinite earths because they had so many years of this continuity problems whereas marvel from the very beginning especially when i guess the the uh silver age silver age comics but when marvel really started in in 1965 mm -hmm. and they started running with fantastic four and spider-man and all these they made a conscious decision, especially because Stan Lee was the one who was writing most of them, to, to have them all exist in this one universe. And uh, so they actually worked on continuity. They kept it that way, at least through the mid-90s. They started falling apart a little bit at that point. But that mentality uh, and, and that goal is what drove the Marvel Cinematic Universe as well. And that's why it's done really well. Because people love to see all these stories interwoven and these characters growing up together and showing up in each other's movies and then coming together in like Avengers and Civil War and things like that, which is amazing. And then, you know, DC's always, they've been at the forefront of like these iconic characters like Batman and Superman, but they've always been following Marvel's lead, trying to humanize their characters or trying to have cohesive continuity. And they've done the same thing in, in cinemas. They're just trying to follow Marvel's lead and it's not working for them. And I think the, you know, when we, we talk about this and I think the most amazing part of the whole story is kind of said where this is the DC A team. You know, this is all their their best heroes right up front. And Justice League was all of them right out there. And then we look at the Marvel universe and the Avengers was kind of like the 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 C squad. It wasn't even B squad. <laughs> you know, this is like Well, yeah. It wasn't like designed to be like the X-Men are supposed to be a little bit higher than this. And well, that's the whole Fox debacle. But, you know, right, it's interesting right. to look back and see that they took a property that was kind of, you know, well, let's just take this one little corner and see what happens. And then it just it blossomed, for lack of a better word. It just kind of exploded, which was crazy. Yeah. It was absolutely. I mean, it's all because they just went with good writing. They got they paid good actors. And they just had fun with it. Yeah. And then and we it, were talking at the break. 
you know, it's not like DC can't do it, but all their best stuff is on TV. You know, absolutely. Because, it, it it absolutely is. Because I love the Flash on TV. We we talked about Legends. Legends is just, ah, it's it's fun. It's bonkers. Right? <laughs> it's fun. Yeah. But that's the thing too. I think the reason why it's working on TV is not only because of the talent that they've got involved, but also because the stakes aren't as high. Right. Like, you know, you, you're putting out this, if you're putting out Justice League and you're putting so much money into this movie, it's got to perform at the box office. Well, the TV series has time to develop characters. It has right. time to develop over 20 plus episodes and they have, they can do crossovers on TV too because it's all in one studio. So there's less pressure to perform. There's more time for things to develop and it's what what's what they need. And so it's worked for it's, them really well. Do you think it's the long form story? Because I mean, it, we're we're kind of getting this this cycle right now, right? It's like one villain, one year, you know, kind of right. getting that seam. And then, of course, you know, with Flash, I would argue that power creep is starting to be a little bit of an issue. It's you know. always going to be an issue with speedsters, and Flash has suffered from that in the comics as well for years. It's like when you, when you're dealing, say, Superman had this problem too. So like Superman started out by being able to leap, you know, really really high or whatever. Then then he could fly, and then he could shoot laser beams out of his eyes, and then he could, he's got X-ray vision, and he's got super breath. I'm mean, just just on and on and on and on. Well, Flash, when you introduce speedsters, and especially the speed force, and you get into time travel, you get into quantum paradoxes. There's all these things. And so you, the power creep, you have to, unfortunately, like in the TV show, sometimes you have to say, well, okay, Barry's getting too strong. Oh, well, Barry like sprains his ankle or something. You know, uh, here's the malady of the week that slows him down. So, you know, he's not, he, uh, regular people like Captain Cold can, you know, get the best right. of him. So yeah. if I can jump in with an outsider's perspective here, having not seen any of the DC <laughs> shows, can I put you guys on the spot for, if there was sure. one that you want to sell me, where should I start? What what DC series is the is the number one? It's a good question. What do you think? I think The Flash. I think you should go back and watch the first season of The Flash. Um, you get to see, uh, even if you just Google, like, uh, the... the um, arrow universe so if you're gonna watch arrow you could watch the episode of arrow where barry is introduced okay. right and then there's a crossover episode where uh, barry becomes the flash and uh arrow um oliver queen helps to train him and then you'll get some of those crawford crossovers and then you're directly into flash and the first season is just awesome it's a lot of fun I can dig it. in my opinion there chris is that the uh you know it's uh it's one of those things that kind of I was a fan from Smallville. I, I, I enjoyed Smallville. Right there with you. You know, and I, I think what made Smallville work, aside from Deanna Cruick, who is cute as a button, <laughs> um, it was, you know, I think it was that he never flies. And I think that that kind of, that tension of when is he ever going to realize his potential and how that just hangs out there um, just kind of really helped move that show. And I think it did a good job of using the Oliver Queen character who looks, um, who looks a lot like Cole from Capstone, just saying. Um, <laughs> right, right? Yeah, I, I'd argue The Flash because The Flash gives you so much, you know. I, I do like Legends a lot. I think Legends is fun because it's the ensemble show and you can do a lot more with that. So, But yeah, Flash yeah. has had me if you don't... from day one. If you don't take Legends 100% seriously, you'll have a good time. Absolutely. <laughs> and you, yeah. 100%. If you're the guy with yarn and thumbtacks in the basement watching that show, <laughs> you're going to have some bloody thumbs and you're not going to be happy. Yes. That's right. Yep. <laughs> that definitely redefined some comedy. But it's, uh, <laughs> no, it's great. And I think the other thing that's been cool about them is the the adding and dropping of characters. I think the variety of characters. I mean, my goodness, they kind of they really run, you know, the spectrum in both the personality, the because uh, <laughs> it's every week. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember vividly and what kind of got me kind of tuned in because because frankly, the, the only comics that I've ever bought were maybe some Richie Riches off the rack at 7-Eleven when I was a kid. I, I was not a comic book guy. Um, I, I really enjoy what's happening now, and I enjoy hearing some of the, the back theories. And I'm, I'm kind of like the guy who got to experience the Harry Potter movies without the books. Like, you can enjoy them on their own for their own thing. 
so so it's fun to enjoy it that way um but it's it's definitely neat and i remember when you guys uh geeked out on the all-stars about the uh the treadmill i'm like dude it's a treadmill who cares <laughs> and you're like no it's the treadmill and you're going off on it and how important it was and it, yeah no this this stationary thing that has been a, a bane of my existence at times is actually a device that allows time travel and i'm like what you mean the thing that's holding up my laundry upstairs can do time travel no no i'm not buying it until i actually saw what you meant and it was it was pretty cool it was pretty cool yeah when you see the cosmic if you're a comics fan you see the cosmic treadmill for the first time you're like oh this is gonna get real this is gonna be great <laughs> you guys definitely were like that so you know you guys are all over the map. Um, you participate in Unpub, am I correct? Mm -hmm, that's correct. Yeah, I've been every to every well, been involved with Unpub since goodness 2011, I guess. But uh, right. been to every Unpub convention since Unpub two. Missed Unpub one uh, by only about like a couple months. But yeah, yeah, I love I love Unpub. It's great, great network and, and great resource. So. Well, wow, we jumped from we jumped from comics to unpub. I don't, you know, it was the publishing thing. I got to work on my uh, my little segues there. Your segues, that's all right. Yeah, segues. You know, not just for riding around San Francisco anymore. <laughs> but the um, but that that always struck me as something really interesting. And if from an outsider looking in, there's a person who, uh, yeah, sure, I have game designs. I sent one to you, by the way. But no, I submitted I, I, one to the dexterity yeah. challenge. Um, I was the uh, the I was the dice tree, the tree fort. I called it. I remember. Right? Yep. <laughs> I remember playing it. We played it at, at uh, Daryl's house over Christmas that year, and we were, we were judging all of them. So sad to say, I didn't make the cut, but <laughs> that was that was a very first attempt, and it was uh, it was interesting. But I, yeah, I it was, it was an interesting guys... concept. Yeah. <laughs> but I love that you guys do that. You're like, you know, hey, we kind of want to add a, a dice game to our repertoire. Let's run a contest and see what's out there, and then you kind of look yeah. and find something. And did anything ever come of that? Because like I remember, it kind of. I don't think you ended up going anywhere. Well, Valley of the Mammoths won. James Myers, he's actually right. a local to me, uh, and it's a it's a fantastic game. We had a lot of we had a lot of fun with that contest. It was just cool to see the different concepts people came up with. The dexterity, the problem that we found after we did it. Um, I, I don't regret doing it because it's fun to see what people come up with. It's also great sure. to engage the design community, which is what I really love to do. I'd love to do another contest for too long, but no, no, we never pulled the trigger on anything from that contest simply because we started looking at the market and dexterity games were not doing very well. And Fair so enough. it's tough, you know, you'll every now and then you'll have a, a never green, like pitch car. Uh, you'll have um, something really special that just now is coming back into print, like ascending empires. But overall, dexterity's uh, games are a tough sell. You know, you've got some croaking old players and things, things like that who get into it. But otherwise, it, it's it's hard. So we've encouraged, you know, we gave James feedback. I've play tested Valid Mammoths with him a few times. And of course, I've helped him to uh, network and get in touch with other publishers who might be interested sure. in doing it. So it was a great contest, though. We had a blast. Now, I kind of, I kind of thought because you know, as somebody who just like, I mean, let's be honest. I, I bought Tenzi and popsicle sticks and a one inch dowel. <laughs> like I didn't go crazy here. Um, it right. was not, but I can only imagine that something on the publishing end that you know, as much as you like the idea of these games, it's like, well, price point has to factor into that too, right? So like, absolutely. As a designer, we have to think about, well, sure, what are the materials? Are they going to be able to get them? Is, there, is it in stock somewhere? Is it readily available, right? Yeah, you have to, uh, both from the, I mean, the unpublished side is like you can pretty much just scrounge and do whatever you want. But you've got to, as a publisher, when you look at that game, a lot of things go through your mind. First, you know, it's like a it, when you stare down at a prototype that somebody's put in front of you or sent to you, you kind of mm -hmm. have a beautiful mind moment knowing like you see numbers sprouting up and you're like, okay, well this set of components is going to be X <laughs> amount. Yeah. And then like, okay, well that's going to be this. And and then you think about, well, what size box is it going to be? And, and how is that going to factor into shipping and the number of things we can get onto a pallet and what is the play time versus the amount of money it's going to cost? Is that going to be justified? So on and so forth. So lots of factors that go in, not just, is it a great game? Because I mean, you can make a great game, but it's got a thousand components to it and it's unpublishable. 
you, you have to think about it from that from that perspective so let's wrap this up with what so you, so you're now in charge of production and you're now receiving games and looking for games what what are some things that you would tell like you know somebody who like i, I have at least five game designs running around in my head that i've <laughs> had for five ten years i'll be honest with you i don't know if any of them will ever even make it to paper but you know what what are some good first steps for us and you know what do you want to see by the time it gets to you um mostly i want to see that you've you've put it you first of all you put it down on paper you've you've written it down you've gotten it to a playable state because ideas right are a dime that. a dozen right there you go because <laughs> ideas are a dime a dozen like you can pitch me an idea and i can be like well, that's a great idea but until you fully realize it build it out get it in front of people and prove that it's actually a viable idea there's nowhere to go from there and so one thing that I look for when I take pictures or I, I see things at Unpub or speed dating or when I meet people at conventions is how fleshed out is that concept? Have they play tested? Does it seem like they've play tested? If I play a sample round or get the, the spiel for it, does it seem like they've done the, the due diligence of not just saying, Hey grandma, come play this game. Right. And you know, grandma goes, Oh, I love it. It's going to make a million dollars. And then you go, <laughs> you know, no, have you have you gone to a game store and put it in front of people that you don't know very well and that gotten brutal feedback and made changes to your game? That that's part of the process. So and, and the game doesn't have to look, you don't have to spend money in art, you don't have to be a great graphic designer. You just need to make something that is playable. Like for instance, I'll make a very good instance of this. So Matt Riddle and Ben Pinchback, which I hope most of the, the uh, viewers the Fleeples. I hope most people know who they are by this point, but the designers of Fleet, uh, Monster Truck Mayhem, um, also Legends of Sleepy Hollow, which is a success story for Dice Hate Me Games. Uh, we're in the middle of that production right now. I know a Matt and Ben prototype because it's all just in black and white and it's line art. You know, sometimes they'll find some stock, uh, you know, co Creative Commons art to throw into a card game or, you know, something like that. But all of Sleepy Hollow was nothing but just black and white words on paper and maps made on, you know, on the computer, but just, you know, straight, you know, black and white lines with delineations and things like that. That's all I needed because I can start as the world builder, see that blank canvas and play the game and understand the mechanics and how they're working. And then I can start to fill in those gaps and say, oh, okay, this is what it's going to look like. And this is what I can imagine this being and this being, you know, so. Well, you've worked with uh, Richard Launius, right? Doesn't, uh... mm -hmm. Isn't he famous yep. for his prototypes looking like they're ready to hit the shelf? Dude, Richard's <laughs> prototypes are insane. <laughs> and and what was great about working with him on on Fate was, you know, we would uh, Daryl and I would go to his house in South Carolina and have like you know some some design retreats. And he's got his whole basement kitted out. He's got like his laminated machine and his printer set up of these these file templates that he does. And he's like he's like, okay, well, what do we need to do? And he sits down and he's doing all this stuff in like Word. He's amazing because he's been working in that program for so long. But yeah, when he makes, when he brings a prototype, it's, it looks like a finished game and it's, you can tell a Richard prototype and it's not a Matt and Ben prototype by any stretch. Yeah. The, um, but I think that the takeaway though, is like you want, you'd rather have a tried and true system that's been vetted rather than the pretty version that needs a lot of post-production work on it, like a lot of developing it, and things like that. Yeah. And I, I'm not afraid of a game that needs development because that's my job, you know, I, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I, I used, I, I like to work better with designers and designs where they have put in the time and gotten the game to a certain spot that is playable and that is enjoyable and that shows its meat. And then I can go in and massage it and say, okay, okay, well, this isn't quite working the way it should be. Let's try this. Right. A tweak here, a tweak there, a tuck here, a tuck there, getting it ready for post-production, get it ready for the market, making sure it's the best game it can be from that point. Um, so even if your game and your game, trust me, no matter how perfect you think your game is, it's going to need some development work because you need somebody that hasn't been you. You need to have some outside eyes on it. And you need somebody that can realize that they're not going to, change your entire game to be something that's not they're going to just make it better yeah and i think it's important to say like you know all the best designers you know benefit from a little development and tweaking and massaging and 
<laughs> while we're talking about games, I think it's time to play one because we kind of do that on this show. I know, you know, I, I've left it up to Dan to design <laughs> something and uh, I don't think he's going to disappoint. So stay tuned for the game right after this. This week's shout out goes out to the Married with Board Games podcast. Join Spencer and Laura as they talk about all things board games, relationships, and time stories. Be sure to check them out wherever you get your daily podcasts. So now it's going to be game time with Mr. Chris Kirkman. It's game time! So the game for today we're going to do is... Uh, snake oil style game. You guys are going to pitch games to me. I'm a potential backer of the Kickstarter project. Oh, here we go. Um, Kickstarter had to work its way into it somewhere, didn't it? Of course. So I'm reading the web page. I'm, I'm coming in here as a novice, and you are going to see how high you can get me to back. Um, we'll be doing a one to five scale. A do- one means I'm throwing in a dollar. I'm going to read the updates the whole time, and I'm probably going to pull my pledge back out on the last day. <laughs> five I was means <laughs> I'm going right up to the top uh, option. I'm, I'm buying everything there is. I'm in for two hundred thirty-five dollars and uh, buying it all. So, so you know, I I think the important thing of a pitch game, Chris, is that you need to know your audience. Okay, and I don't think it's fair that that I know Dan. And while Dan is not a full-on thematic. Simon gamer he definitely enjoys theme we play a lot of times together we play Battlestar Galactica um so so Dan what kind of games are are the kind what's your wheelhouse right. so that well, so that the viewers know and Chris knows so that we can kind of you know we want to we want to attract you here well you can try to cater to me but the real key here is that these are all going to appeal to me automatically because Brew Crafters was a beer-based game everyone can play. Now okay. we're going deep. Now we're going for the real beer lovers. These are games that are going to be themed upon a single beer style. Oh, okay. Uh, All so right. I'm going to throw a beer style at you. I'll, I'll, I'll describe it a little for the folks who might not be familiar with some of the beers I'm going to throw out. <laughs> and then you guys will already know, and you will take that beer style, what it inspires... What would you build a game that was just that style? So, so Chris, it sounds like you might have to make a whole separate division that falls under the Brewcrafter umbrella <laughs> at this point. There you go. Yeah, we'll have to the Brewcrafter series of games. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you already have two, right? Absolutely. And a third yeah. one on the way. Third one on the way. Mm-hmm. But, so, so wait a second. So, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Dan. The game's cool, <laughs> but I got I got to get me some. Uh, I don't usually allow a pitch on the show, but come on, you got to tell me what what's the next what's the next one. The next one is called Home Brewers, and it comes out. Uh, we're going to kickstart it in September during Oktoberfest, uh, toward the end of September, beginning of October, and we it's by Ben Rossett and Matthew O'Malley. So Ben okay. and Matthew are the designers. Ben is the designer of the original Brewcrafters, right. obviously. It's also a dice collaboration game. So you're basically, you're playing as home brewers in a neighborhood and you're trying out crazy recipes to get ready for Oktoberfest where they're all going to be judged. Uh, recipes, you're adding recipes on to the different um, uh, styles of ales, porter stouts, IPAs, things like that that you're doing. And uh, so you can make like, you know, a, a kimchi cinnamon bourbon stout. You Good know, this is the... I know exactly. That's what homebrew is all about because it's about these crazy combinations that you can come up with, and people have just been having a blast because you end up with these combos that you make. Because when you add recipes or uh, flavors to the recipes, then you create an engine that builds up throughout the eight months of the game. One of the 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 outstanding things about brew crafters is the first player marker, which is that <laughs> awesome pint of stout, imperial pint, I might add. So I think this needs to be, um, I think it needs to be a like a, a beard like dance. I think it needs to just be like a big, <laughs> a big hipster beard. And I think that that we'll needs to be. just get it out the... of the box and you put it on. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And maybe, you know, all right, Okay. let's, let's untime out and 
let's get back to the game. So we're pitching games to you. You like mm-hmm. games about beer, so you're already a a, a you backer. Have my interest. Yeah. All right. So, <laughs> all right. It won't be hard to get me in for a buck, but how much further can you go? So we're gonna start number one. We're gonna start with a, a style that's near and dear to my heart. I think uh, uh, Chris is there with me. Um, Imperial Stouts. So you know, you guys know well. Imperial Stouts gonna be it's gonna be roasty. It's gonna be. Uh, high ABV, it's going to be uh, strong and full-bodied, and w- what's that going to inspire in a game? Maybe why don't, pick you, the why don't you start us out? All right. <laughs> I'll pick the setting. You go well, ahead, and I'm going to do the development work on this one. You know, if we, we trace a stout, I mean, the stout goes back. When I think stout, I'm thinking, I mean, Guinness goes back. So we're thinking 1800s, and I think this needs to just be a big economic game you know we're we're not making the beer but i think we just need to sell the beer and maybe build tech trees to develop different types what do you think i think that the, you're on the right track there it definitely should have a historical setting probably 1700s 1800s and we should try to track the development and spread of a company like guinness throughout you know, whether it's Ireland or we choose a different country, but it could be even a made-up beer type. But, but Guinness would be fascinating to do. But tracking economically the spread of the beer and trying it in different markets, try, because the different markets are going to have different economic uh, needs, which is going to add that Euro meat to it. Right. Um, so you're going to have to deal with the constant flux of what those different uh, um, e- emerging markets are going to be throughout uh, first the UK and then spreading worldwide which would be, be, be awesome. Yeah. And I think we could have, I, I see the expansion, like the Pilsner expansion, where we could do the same thing. And you kind of said it, can, but starts in Czechoslovakia. We can, we can do their, uh, when they jump the shark and put out that American Blonde Ale not too yeah. long ago. <laughs> that was a little creepy. I could, not, I could not in good conscience drink that. I love my Guinness, but I'm like, what are y'all doing? Just yeah, the, do that's what your you game do best. Condition right there. As yeah, soon we, as the American <laughs> blonde hits the table, that's the final round. Game's over. <laughs> yes, I like it though. It, it's big. It's it's heavy. I think it it definitely has to be economic and span time, and then you kind of develop the tech and the distribution channels. I could I could well, see that. To, you'll have to manage also your warehousing because you know Guinness used to be just simply uh, based in Dublin, and now they have to have separate you know, brewing facilities, not only around Ireland, but in in each individual country that they make the Guinness and and ship the Guinness to. And of course, then you got to manage shipping your water because you can't make Guinness without the the right kind of water. So lots of logistics and things you can manage. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, so, so this, this would, um, Hmm. I, I don't know if we go full on splatter with this one, but I definitely think it's, it's pushing that kind of, that kind of intense territory. So, so that, I think that's pretty like, good. This could be like the D mocker of, <laughs> of beer right. games. Yeah, yeah. Maybe it is two people competing. <laughs> maybe it is like, you know, Sam Smith's versus Guinness. And we just kind of go in head to head. You do, you do Murphy's versus Guinness. There you go. And to be honest with you, I love my Guinness, but. It may be yeah. controversial, but I'm a Murphy's guy. I yeah, love you, my Murphy's. You give me Murphy's Irish on draft, I'll I'll choose that over. No, I agree yeah. completely. Well, A, the Murphy's is usually imported where the Guinness comes from, Canada, which while very polite, <laughs> is not quite as good. Right. All right, Dan. So what do you think? Are we talking five here? Nice, wow. heavy, deep, economic, two player, I think we kind of found wound out with here. I tell you, I, I uh I dig logistics games. Okay. So, and that's where you guys were leaning. Um, you lost. You lost a point maybe because we really went. We really went with stouts uh, in general and got away from the imperial stout. Imperial part. I was, over, I was too specific, but that's okay. Okay. Because then Chris threw in. It's the democker of board of <laughs> beer games, and that's that's worth a point right there. So. <laughs> so I think we're coming in at a four. Solid um, four. Yeah, we're 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 backing hard. Okay. Okay. So we're backing hard. So you know, the two hundred dollar get your name on the box pledge, but you're maybe sitting like the one fifty, give me all the stuff and yeah. everything else. Yeah, I don't I don't get to uh... oh, we should build that. That's gonna you know, it's just a few cards in in a box. I think we can make some money with that one. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right, Dan. So what's our next style? And then, Chris, you're going to lead this one off. You kind of set okay. the scene, and we'll go from there. Okay. So now we're going a very different tone here. Um, I want us to build a game based on Cezanne. Um, so Cezanne's going to mm. be – it's going to be earthy. It's going to be funky. It's golden and light, um, but but all sorts of wild things going on in there. Can be sour. doesn't have yeah, to be. Yeah, th that's up to you. Oh well. All right, so whenever I think got? of yeah, whenever I think of saisons, I think of sort of like wild cards. You know, they okay. Depending on how they're made, they have a lot of interesting different tastes in it. What I also think of when I think of saisons is how they sometimes can sneak up on you because they're easy to drink, and uh, they can start if you have two or three of them, they can start yeah. to sneak up on you. So yeah, they, I'm gonna they can pitch, hit that nine percent. Yes, I'm gonna <laughs> pitch this one as more of a social game. Okay. And I'm going to probably say the working title for this is Who Drank My Beer? Oh, I like so, this. So, yeah, I'm thinking we need to have a trader mechanic in this one. So we're going <laughs> to, we're basically going to be taking the Saison, but we're going to have a, a tasting, like a flight of different things. And now you got to figure out, based, based on that flight, uh, who's backing or who is a part of, or giving you that particular beer style based on cues that they'll either be built into the actual board itself or a card play. And so now we can kind of build that, that more social gaming experience. So I know you like BSG. Mm -hmm. So, and yeah. I love social, I love social games. You cannot, and I, and, and we could have one that involves alcohol and beer and something that has such a varied flavor profiles like a saison or getting into some of those uh, farmhouse ales and things like that so yeah so i think maybe maybe the uh the trader is trying to turn every beer into a sour <laughs> yeah. or an ipa well hey come on now <laughs> yeah, yeah. we have different uh the hops card. about what trader, like, <laughs> treason represents here you turn them all yeah, into yeah. sour <laughs> Okay, so 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 no, depending no, no. on your personal to put all taste, the hops in there, yeah. <laughs> so depending on your personal taste, maybe the trader is a sour or maybe it's a hop. I mean, kind of. <laughs> you could have both in there, and they're just trying to get. They're just trying to sneak into every beer style that you play okay. out. But are we playing cards out blindly and then trying I to? I feel like it could almost be. I'd like to be at a slightly meatier party game than just regular a regular party game, and whether that's you know, constitutes you've got to not only de determine what a person's beer style that they like, right. but also try to try to sneak something in that not is against their style without them knowing. So it's probably card exchanging, and okay. also um, sort of almost resistance style too, where you're trying to ascertain, uh, who is the one that's trying to sneak that ingredient into your batch to turn your beer against what you like. Oh, I like, okay. That, that you, you just got me there with the Avalon mechanic that it's kind of <laughs> where we're all trying to make a collaborative beer, but then somebody's always trying to sneak hops in, or if the player counts large <laughs> right. enough there, then you also have a person trying to make everything a sour. I think that's it. <laughs> I like it. I like it. You can have a different game state no matter what. I mean, we're getting a little bit away from the Saison, but the Saison could be right. the base of it. It's simply That's because it. That's the core. Every game's a wild card. Yeah. Yep. All the, the core five styles are Saison, and that's what's trying to go out. And then we're just, somebody's always trying to mess up the pot and throw some hops in there. <laughs> I think that's a perfect rabbit game right there, actually. <laughs> and this is, <laughs> and here you've really hit a sweet spot for me, the, the rabbit Pardon game. Pardon the pun. Uh, I'm a, oh. Uh, uh, <laughs> the rabbit game is, is, is right where I inhabit. I can never resist uh, a meaty game that's in a little deck of cards. I've got me Isle of Trains, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and so you're doing that. You're doing the trader mechanic. There's a lot of things here that are all looking, are working really well for me. So I think I'm in for five, especially because this is not a high component Kickstarter. The, no. the, the top backer level here is you know it's 50 bucks 20 bucks or oh, well okay. yeah oh, if that, i like the yeah, way you yeah. run a kickstarter <laughs> yeah but, but you know what you can get the entire brew crafter line for just 100 like you can get all three of the brew crafters and then you can get the second rapid game in the line you know that is that's a very valid statement i think that's good salesmanship <laughs> right there <laughs> it's beautiful it's beautiful i'm, I'm an easy scorer here because i'm giving this a five all right so we're awesome. sitting at a 4.5 average Sir, I think we can do one more. I think we got one more game in us. All right. 
What do you think? I'm going to throw you guys a curveball here. It's, it's not going to be IPA, I guess. No, 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 no. We're not, we're not being that easy. <laughs> the last style is mead. Not, mead. Ooh, not beer I at love all, mead. but also still, you know, very popular Ooh. for the homebrew crowd. Now, this is it a is. honey wine. This is going to tend to be sweet. Um, have a very different profile from beer, but a lot of craft goes into this too. What do you think? Oh, I don't know. This one's tough because I don't know a lot <laughs> about mead. So I'm, I'm going to have to default a lot. Um, yeah. let's, think, let's think about how that relates to mead because I do like mead quite a bit. The, the mead making process is pretty fascinating, but also you have to know your honey. So okay. when you're making mead, uh, the basis of that is not only uh, the flavors that you have, but also your sources of honey and the different types of honey that you make uh, or, or source for the, the mead itself. So we could even go okay. a step further and involve the honey making process as well as the meat ah. making process. So maybe okay. you know, there have been there have been some attempts at bee, bee games coming out. A process game that starts at the very source, which is the bees, then the honey, then all the way to the mead, then out into the marketplace. Now, yeah, how can we, we do that? Bag building, because, you know, why not? Why not? I, it, it, I'd, I'd argue it's like my favorite mechanic at the moment. Um, I, I think maybe you collect honey in the form of, um, well, I'd say cubes, but I think uh, hexagons make a lot more sense. <laughs> right? I like that, yeah. But I think maybe you collect honey in the form of these. And then, you know, maybe because you have to source different honey growers would determine the different honeys that go in the bag. And then you have to find a way to get them out to make your mead. It could be with the bag building selection process, you could be, you, it could be a drafter. So right. you can do like automobile style. You'll be drafting from a pool of things or a pool of honey styles that uh, you'll have some, a set of re mead recipes and you'll have probably a demand for those different recipes in uh, whether different markets, but we don't have to go markets. We could probably just right. simply say for your distribution and your variety. So you can go, Oh, let's not only do bag builder, but the recipe, we can either do set collection or varied. So you either can be the best at one thing, or you can have this wide variety yeah. of flavor profiles. I that like you it. Build out depending on what you do with, with taking not only honey from the source. So it begins with drafting the honey, put it into the bag, which you can draft out during a certain round. Then you can complete recipes and those recipes can then be later scored depending upon, uh, you know, three or four different scoring types that we have based upon set collection from that, from that, that particular, um, source mechanic of bag building right no i like that i like that a lot and then i think you know maybe we could maybe have different pools out there to choose from you know kind of mm -hmm. like azul's doing right like we have different pools but maybe we use the snake mechanic from like glenn moore where you know yeah. you get choices based on when you go in turn order and what you can choose is based it's on kind of that snake such cap. a such a good mechanic and it's I been used it. um it hasn't really seen a lot since Glenmore, which I'd like to see more of it done. So I really like that. Yeah. Kraftwagen. That's it. Now yeah, I don't feel like an idiot. Yeah. There you go. All right. But <laughs> so, all right. So maybe it's not, I mean, it could just be chits. It could be printed. It could be different styles, different houses that might produce said different honeys from your local area. They make different markets selected mm, from this, this turn order selection method from Glenmore where we, and there's like there's got to be other actions like a mix and a draw and a refine kind of action involved and then we go so really meat is just the end we're just building a recipe and then pop it's out we're not trying to yep. market it we're not trying to do anything with it that can be the expansion but we're just I think trying it's to just make the it. just doing the meadery you're you're operating your meadery you're making your mead yeah I like it I like it so what do you think Dan okay so. I like the honey angle. I like that we went, you know, we take it all the way back to the ingredient. You can worry about what, you know, where you're... Uh... We distilled it down to the honey. Ooh. Dad no, jokes. There's no distilling involved here. Um, <laughs> I, I like bag building. Glenn Moore, you hit, a, you hit a spot right in my heart right there. Oh, uh, see, I, I was trying to hit his spot. I didn't uh, know I hit yours, oh, too. Yeah, it works, too. Um, but it's okay because I was feeling bad about all these high scores. So you help me out by giving me oh. this like like four shades of brown like angle you're gonna go. <laughs> well, I mean, you I know, have this 
I have this little pet peeve about colors you can't distinguish in, in, in board game bits. So um, that's fair. That's fair. I, I also do think this would fit beautifully in the like dice hate me line because you could do a real Americana feel with. Oh the, yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, um, the the honey farmers the. Uh, uh, the beekeepers. So uh, we're, we're definitely in there for a three. I like this game. I'm interested, but I don't. I don't need any. Uh, I don't need any of the higher tiers. That's I think fair. that's fair because I mean this is probably our less least refined idea, but it needs some development work. It needs a little massaging. Yeah. 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 It's like we we know what we want in there, but you know, trying to get it to pull the theme in and to pull yeah. everything in is, is we need gonna... we need it to make sense. Yes, <laughs> yeah. yes, because because we all know the best games make sense. <laughs> <laughs> well, except for the abstracts, but you know that's right. neither here nor there. Absolutely, thanks, Dan. That was good. I like that. That was a lot of fun. So, thanks for playing along, Chris. That was enjoyable. But this this always yeah, drives me nuts because I I do I think deep down I have a creative itch to scratch with a game at some point someday. I don't know. I just. Well, that's been a lot of fun. So, Chris, if people want to find you, where can they find you on the internet? You can always, always, always find me on Twitter at Dice Hate Me, which is down there in the lower third. You can see it right there. You can also find me at DiceHateMe.com. Uh, you can find me on Instagram at Dice Hate Me. And, of course, you can go to GreaterThanGames.com and DiceHateMeGames.com to check out our products and the things that I work on and do. Awesome. And be sure to check him out on the State of Games and the Geek All-Stars. We appreciate it. Appreciate you listening. Anybody out there who wants to check those out, the State of Games is available on iTunes, iHeartRadio, and uh, tune in. Uh, the Geek All-Stars, well, go to geekallstars.com. It is available, <laughs> on iTunes. It's available on iTunes, though. So, Well, thanks for being on. Thanks for watching. And be sure to enjoy some Dice Hate Me games when you game all night. Well, that's a wrap. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed our efforts at comedy and fun, please support us on PodPledge. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And of course, don't forget to engage with us on Board Game Geek Guild 3134. You can also check us out on our website, GameAllNightShow.com. This show has been made possible through supporters like these. Angry Octopus. But I figured we kind of went high, so I wanted to kind of, you know, juxtapose those, juxtapose those, <laughs> juxtapose. Juxtapose, <laughs> yeah. So I had to be both bleeped and blurred in the first episode. <laughs> Paradox, who cares? Who we cares? Care. Paradox every week. Yeah, exactly. Oh, that's it. That's the crossover. Two Dans, two Chris's, and then, yeah. Uh, I say I'm going to edit yeah. that out. I'm totally not going to edit that out. I'm going to let my... <laughs> I'm going to let my ignorance show because it's sitting. 